Good afternoon. So my name is Amir. I am a faculty here at IHS, and I'll be kind of uh, moderating this session, not chairing, because <laughs> I don't like. I I am more eager to learn about what uh, all of them would be presenting. But uh, mm, I think uh, uh, what I'll do is uh, first I'll uh, ask each one of them to introduce themselves. So maybe a couple of uh, minutes about who they are, where, where, what are, what they have been doing, and uh, what they have been working on, what their qualifications are, etc., etc. General interest of everyone. Mm. Uh, then I kind of briefly uh, make some statements, three or four, that's uh, not directly related to smart cities, but largely provocated uh, uh, in the sense that uh, those are the four odd things that I have been personally grappling with uh, researching the urban and the region for some time now. And then I'll uh, let the floor uh, be to these uh, presenters. We'll give them 15 minutes each. We'll let the presentations finish, and then we can uh, have the Q&A later on. So can we start with Deepak? Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Deepak. I'm a, I'm a PhD scholar at uh, the Center for the Study of Law and Governance at uh, John and Nehru University. And what I'm going to present today is uh, part of my research proposal that I'm working on. I'm trying to look at uh, how uh, citizenship is getting impacted in the days of new liberal urban governance and I'm trying to look at from the lens of smart cities in India. Thank you. Hello, uh, myself Purushottam. Uh, I'm a doctoral candidate at Radboud University Netherlands and uh, as an external candidate and uh, I also contribute uh, the urban design coursework in Manipal University. Uh, I'm an architect with graduate courseworks in city planning and geography. Uh, I'm particularly interested more in the power knowledge complex in the future and also the social materi materiality that is being reproduced through the, that particular power knowledge complex and how that is going to impact the way the future for our cities and I put the smart cities and maybe other generic forms of uh, futures into that particular perspective and try to you know elucidate you know uh, or maybe you know predict the way you know how our cities are going to be. Yeah, thank you. Is this working? There we go. Uh, Glenn Keeker, I'm from DePaul University in Indiana, about four hours from Chicago. I am trained as a Latin American historian of a specialization in 19th century regional Mexican history. However, for the past six, seven years, I've been focused on uh, questions about the future in the 21st century from a systems perspective, uh, how we're gonna weather the perfect storm of systemic collapse. Within that question, I'm looking at cities and more narrowly looking at what role the smart cities play. And I've done work uh, in the past on New Songdo City and have recently turned my attention to India's smart cities missions. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Tristan. Uh, I'm the least credentialed person here, so you should listen to them and not take me as seriously. Uh, Glenn is my ex-professor. I graduated from DePauw as well, uh, studying urban studies and energy studies. And uh, my research, I guess we co-authored it, so our research, but I'm interested in this research and smart cities in particular because um, I like studying the intersection of urbanism and India, which is the country that I grew up in, alongside what we call 21st century uh, crises, which we'll get into in the presentation. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Uh, <clears throat> just to recap, based on, I don't know whether you have abstracts with you, but uh, largely we have three presentations, and they are all focused on smart cities, uh, which came into the mainstream in around 2014. And uh, in some way or the other, all of these papers are responding to this idea of smart cities. So essentially meaning, uh, uh, what is it? 
uh, what does it mean for region, urban, people, uh, processes, and how does it fit into the imagination of a city. So I think that's, uh, that is what I am seeing as the first uh, thing that is uh, coming up. And of course, we learn from what they have found and uh, maybe have an interesting discussion. And uh, second uh, aspect is that, uh, okay, if not smart, then what? What is the alternate imagination? Uh, do we have an alternate imagination? Uh, uh, have we done some, uh, have we kind of found some examples uh, which uh, can guarantee better outcomes? Uh, the kind of problems which we are witnessing in cities. So I think these are the two principal questions that, uh, in my opinion, we would be talking about uh, in this session. Uh, many of you, uh, I see some of them because I know some of them. We have been working in the urban for almost two, three decades now. And we have seen many missions, programs, schemes, policies, etc. And, uh, but the fact is that uh, we don't yet have a blueprint that would define what sustainable urbanization is. So I think that's a reality that we all understand. <coughs> and uh, I have been also, as you all are, engaging with this question, these kinds of questions for some time now. And uh, broadly, uh, and these are not like findings, but some questions that I am also grappling with. And I am also trying to find answers to. Uh, and uh, and perhaps in some form or the other, we might be touching on these issues. First is, I think, uh, all of these programs, missions, policies, etc., have become <coughs> uh, some kind of an extension of how do we do, how do we uh, kind of manage money flows. Uh, it's like essentially cash flows, uh, statements, financial statements, and uh, I think uh, Glenn will be talking from a theoretical point of view about uh, these, this idea. That's the dominant, I think, uh, uh, dominant uh, kind of narrative, which at least I see from India. Uh, so we make detailed project reports, we look at cash flows, etc. But how uh, well we are uh, uh, developing these cash flows and how are we uh, ascribing values to certain costs and benefits, whether everyone is included in this exercise, we don't know. Uh, the evidence is that uh, not everyone is uh, included. Leave aside inclusion, people, many of them are not aware of and many of them don't even understand what does what does this mean <coughs> to their lives that is the first thing. the second aspect is uh, this whole idea between urban and region about fluxes a lot of things are happening between the urban and the region uh, resources moving people are moving there is infrastructure that connects the two uh, how all of this uh, development and the way uh, these things have kind of evolved in the last couple of decades have been responsible for the outcomes, <coughs> be it uh, for individuals, be it for uh, systems. So I think the evidence there is not so much. Also more important is that uh, what is essentially mediating these outcomes? What are, what's the uh, broad architecture of these factors that's kind of responsible for uh, the outcomes we are witnessing? The third is, I think this is uh, a very uh, statement that may like reflect of dejection, but I think it's reasonably clear. I work with many city governments. There's absolutely no logic of urban development. There's no logic. Uh, we, ne we need to have some starting point and some end point, and, and that imagination has to be consistent. I don't find that logic. It's like largely reactive and there's no forward thinking or forward looking perspective. And the last thing which I would like to touch upon is that uh, 
think there is no, uh, uh, and I find it uh, quite a lot in my work, there is a complete disregard uh, for uh, processes. I think we do certain things following certain ways to do this, or to, do, to do those things. And these have been found to be useful, but either they are done as a lip service or, or even in some cases, many cases, people don't believe in those processes. And also, uh, uh, many cases, uh, there are no, not enough normative guidelines to kind of uh, manage those processes or help implement those processes. I think uh, this is a broad story which might have been reflected in other panels as well, but uh, these are reflections uh, based on my work. But I think uh, it will be nice to hear from uh, people on the dais and also in the audience so that we can collectively learn something new, uh, go back with some new ideas and new frameworks and maybe take it forward in our work and other endeavors. So with this uh, introduction, I'll invite Glenn and Krista to make their presentation. Uh, so they'll be having 15 minutes. Uh, we'll uh, have all the presentations first, and then we'll open up, open it up for discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Those are very provocative uh, introductory frames and comments. Very useful. And uh, what I'd like to add to this, um, oops, we need to have our PowerPoint queued up. What, what uh, we'd like to add to this is uh, the sense of urgency to the moment uh, that's connected to the global crises that we face. And in a big part, that's our motivation uh, in looking at uh, India's Smart Cities mission. And part of the larger argument that we have in play is thinking about uh, the importance of urbanization in India and a particular smart cities mission as a response to the global crises that are deepening in the 21st century. So the urgency to coming up with answers to the opening questions and frames that were just presented to us, um, I think are quite important. Uh, so, um, and so, um, yeah, so this is uh, what I was mentioning, you know, when I gave my bio, is uh, what we study um, at City Lab, which is what our collective is called, uh, contextualizes whatever we talk about in urbanism uh, within these 21st century crises. And, I mean, you could break the, that into two parts, right? 21st century and crises. So the crises part refers to the actual issues that the world is facing. And they're in some cases, they're new, unseen, and revolutionary. And in other ways that they're old problems that were simply sort of delayed that have now resurged to cause extra issues. So uh, food security was a, you know, a non-issue uh, when mechanization was first invented, and now we're facing issues with hunger again. Climate change, similarly, is reaching a zenith that we've never experienced before, and action is uh, required now. Whereas in the past, people sort of shoved it aside. The 21st century refers to this is the century in which several of these crises will converge to cause what we call the perfect storm, where you'll see issues of hunger, climate change, and uh, a dwindling of fossil fuels, um, a, a crisis of health. These are all issues that are going to converge within this next century. So it's sort of a make or break century. And the, the, the century does sound like quite a large scale when you think about it. But realistically, in the, you know, over the scale of civilization, it's, it's really but a moment where we have to decide uh, whether we'll sink or swim as a, a civilization. So we turn to Henri Lefebvre and uh, his Urban Revolution, originally published in 1970, um, in order to um, kind of address this question of the, the 21st century crises. And we're interested in uh, the importance of the planetary urbanization uh, concept and proposition as a way to look at India's smart cities mission and to raise the question uh, as to whether or not the smart cities mission is a silver bullet answer, solution, or response uh, to the larger crises. And then in that context, we're interested in understanding if we throw planetary urbanization to analysis of the start 
Smart Cities mission, um, what does this do to our understanding of the concept of region? And in many ways, then, that's our central question. The argument that we're putting forward um, is tentative, um, and it's suggesting, first off, that the notion of region is an empty signifier. And because it's an empty signifier, um, it, it can become easily destabilized um, as a concept, as a proposition. And so we're arguing that we now live in a moment of deep and profound uh, destabilization of the concept of region. And following Brenner, um, we're arguing that we need a new vocabulary uh, for understanding what the concept of region is. And we're also arguing that perhaps the notion of region has become something uh, of an anachronism. Uh, that our notion of region is no longer in keeping uh, with the time period that we're in. So like Glenn mentioned, we're using Henri Lefebvre's um, thesis to sort of explain um, the smart cities, uh, the, the fundamental philosophy behind some of what the smart cities mission is proposing. And uh, these are some of the uh, key principles that he expounded in, uh, was it 1968? I think it was 68. 1968-ish. Um, and uh, so these are, are the different frameworks that we sort of explore. Now, the last one, every urbanism, er, urbanist worth their salt knows what it is. But the other ones sort of lend a unique uh, framing to an issue that really isn't explored from this perspective, and especially not from the perspective of this sort of nascent, explosive urbanism in this side of the world. So one of the uh, more important concepts that we get in uh, the book um, from Lefebvre um, is the notion of implosion and explosion. Um, and in this framework, um, I think the, the problematic uh, that's thrown at us is uh, what Brenner describes to us is that we now have uh, an urbanism uh, without an outside. And if we really think about that as a spatial metaphor, uh, what happens to the concept of region? So if you have a, an urbanism without an outside, uh, does that eradicate, does that make impossible the concept or proposition of region? So then if you don't have a concept of region um, as a signifier, then uh, what, what replaces it? Right? Is it, is it the urban form? Um, is it some other abstraction of what spatial relationships are about? Similarly, I mean, uh, Lefebvre was a Marxist philosopher, and when we examine this from the perspective of capital, we see that, okay, if we have urban, or uh, the urban without an outside, then we, instead of where we had urban and then rural, and there were certain cultural and economic boundaries between the two, the urban-rural divide, now what we have is the urban and what is subservient to the urban very explicitly in one where the capital is received and one that generates capital solely to be extracted from. So that gets us to the key point about secondary circuit of capital in, in a phase analysis. And what's important here um, is to just uh, emphasize the critical role that uh, smart urbanism um, and smart city proposition plays in the reproduction of capital in the 20th century, and especially in the area of speculative capital and real estate development, and then the key role that the city plays in the reproduction of capital. Then we can connect this to the problematic of region and ask ourselves, okay, if the city's playing a role right, in the reproduction of capital in the 21st century through smart city urbanism, what happens to the concept of region? Is it reproducing that basic notion of central place theory that puts an emphasis right, on the economic central place that cities play and how regions function and operate? So should we conceptualize smart city urbanism as a continuation right, of the concept of region as kind of constructed by modernist notions anchored in an economic central place anchored in capital's reproduction? We see this sort of bubble economy almost within the smart cities where if you think about it almost from a venture capital perspective, they're really selling a product for which there is no plan and more importantly, no working prototype. And the, uh, the hype, if you will, surrounding this is, is extraordinary, but it does have a limit and we can see that the bubble does burst in some scenarios. Uh, for example, when talking about Polera yesterday, 
right? That was a, a smart city that you basically couldn't even ask people to come and inhabit because there was no, it was a doldrum economically. So there is a way, a, a, a point at which the bubble will burst. Now, will the secondary circuit of capital inflate to such a point where that bubble hurts irreparably? That's yet to be seen. The question of the great crises in capitalism, the periodic crises in capitalism, that brings us to Lefebvre's notion of the critical zone, which for my thinking is probably his most provocative concept and proposition, but it's the one that's least looked at. And it's the one that I would really invite uh, people to be thinking heavily about as we're trying to figure out what's coming in the 21st century. So the critical zone is a famous notion of 100% uh, urbanization of the planetary system. Now that doesn't mean that everything becomes you know, urban or the city. It means that the whole entire planetary system is defined by the logic of the city of urbanism. And his argument uh, back in 1970 was projecting, anticipating that we were moving towards the path of 100% urbanization. Our argument is we're there. Right, we've reached that point. This then uh, raises all sorts of fascinating questions about the problem of transition. What happens after the 100%? You just statically sit at 100% urbanization? Um, so is there a post-critical zone reality? Are we in the critical zone? Or have we transitioned out of that critical zone, that post period after 100% urbanization? Part of our argument is that smart cities, India Smart Cities mission, is right the proposition right um, of critical zone urbanism. This is what you do at this historical moment when you've reached 100% urbanization. This is the urban form for it. through because she held up the sign. Um, so the blind field is another interesting concept that uh, Henri Lefebvre brought up. And this is fascinating in that it's almost through an, a philo an urban philosophy, this acts as a tinted lens developmentally. So you can, so certain things, certain urban realities, if you will, are obscured. And these are more often populations that have been overlooked before or urban realities that no one really wants to deal or contend with. The reality of the 21st century is, whereas this was not a huge deal if people overlooked a century ago, two centuries ago, these problems is now, have now welled up and they're adding to the massive wicked problem that we now have to deal with. I think part of that proposition is that our systems of thought and the way that power and knowledge frameworks function and operate have uh, created very powerful blinders uh, that prevent us from understanding the context that we live in. Um, and then that, that is going to be part of the 21st century crises. In this context, uh, we then have the right to the city. Um, and our fundamental question is really going to become if there's a right to the city, um, is there an associated right to the region? And how do we conceptualize what that might look like um, and what that, what that might mean? Now, some of our conversations in this conference about the right to the city have done a great job by pulling out the importance of understanding the everyday, right? and the, the everyday reality in the city. However, we've come up quite short in understanding that that's not the end of the process for Hanu Lefebvre. The whole point to the everyday, the whole point to the right to the city, right, is that the city itself, right, is the grave digger of capitalism. It creates the context in which consciousness and awareness of the urban inhabitants, right, what Lefebvre called the citizens, right, rise up and eliminate capital and capitalism. So this puts front and center right, the problematic of capital in the 21st century and what happens to capital in the urban form through smart city urbanism as we move forward. Do smart cities create the context for the citizen to become the grave diggers in the 21st century? And in that context of urgency, does that happen fast enough before the systemic collapse visits us. 
So in our project, one of the things that we look at is sort of the notion of technocracy, or as we term it, the technocratic delusion, which is really catchy, within the Indian Smart Cities mission. Because a lot of what we see is, is technologically quite marvelous and unprecedented, but in terms of planning and in terms of, of uh, society, um, it's almost like technology is sort of just being unceremoniously added to an existing urban structure, which is, as we all know, deeply flawed for the most part in India with um, economic, class, caste, divisions, all of these. So it is our argument that this poor application of technology is actually recreating and in some cases enhancing digital divide or societal divides digitally. And that is preventing the realization of the citizen, the fully actualized urban citizen in Indian smart cities. And naturally, we can't have a right to the city that is fully realized until that becomes a thing of the past. So we have a, um, to conclude, we have a set of questions. Um, and I don't know how, how well you guys can read them from out there. They came out small. Um, so I don't think we're going to, um, for the sake of time, go through the questions um, in any great detail. Um, I think our point, though, right, is that uh, the paper itself uh, probably is raising more questions for consideration than offering answers to right, the theoretical problems that we're putting on the table. So in part, we put forward a set of questions to invite people uh, to kind of think along with us about what we're trying to, trying to figure out um, in, in the paper. Can everybody see those in the back? I can read them aloud once as well. No? Okay. That's cool. That's all we have. As we sort of go into questions, we invite you to sort of remember some of this, yeah, yeah, <laughs> to consider these uh, for questions that we might throw around in a discussion later. Thank you. Uh, ask you to wait and ask uh, Deepak uh, to proceed with his presentation because they finished with his right to the city and he's essentially talking about the same thing. Thank you. Um, 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 thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my uh, paper in this research conference. And distinguished professors, research scholars, and urban practitioner, for the past two days, I've dwelt on the dynamics of uh, cities and, and, and debated on the rubrics of uh, planetary urbanization and provide a critical perspective into the relationship between the city and region. I attempt here to take the discussion further by exploring the idea of citizenship in the wake of smart cities mission in India highlighting the likely impact of membership right in such developed zones. This paper is part of my uh, PhD research proposal, which, um, which is, uh, is at the initial stage of development. So I'll be uh, uh, looking forward to your suggestions and comments. So the Smart Cities Mission in India was launched on 25th June 2015 to develop 100 smart cities. Harnessing technology to improve the quality of life of people in such cities is the core idea of the mission. This urban governance mechanism has inherent Im implications for citizenship as a membership right. Assuming those having membership of such cities enjoying a host of citizenship rights, uh, for example, access to basic services at the cost of those excluded. In this context, the paper attempts to explore the smart cities mission in India, emerging scholarship on smart cities and citizenship. Notion of citizenship as membership rights for delineating how does smart cities in India impact uh, citizenship of the deprived sections. Citizenship as a membership right is my normative positioning. So then, uh, in the rush for cities acquiring or made to obtain a smart tag under the smart cities mission, by keeping the definitional ambiguity intact of what is a smart city, you know, but a new attempt is being made to address the challenges of urbanization and provide better living conditions to people. The advocates of the mission equate this model of urban governance to nothing less than an urban renaissance, and calling for smart cities and uh, that uh, technology led uh, smart cities in India would inhabit. The critics, however, suggest such an attempt to govern cities by corporate entities, special purpose vehicle led, um, led by CEO, undermining a constitutional framework for urban local governance as for the aim that commodifying cities, which would uh, lead to segregated spaces and impact citizenship rights. In this spectrum, the mission provides a critical, uh, crucial lens to examine the impact on citizenship as membership right. 
The smart city mission has two components, area-based development and uh, pan-city development. So first, a small area will be developed and later, the entire city will be taken on a development path. For the selection of cities, uh, competitions were held in different rounds, four rounds and a fast-track round, and 100 cities have been selected and allowed to go to implement uh, projects for the development of smart cities with uh, financial locations here between the center and the respective state. Uh, cities were selected on the basis of a competition at two levels. At the first, at the state level, there was entire level uh, uh, competition that was organized, and then the uh, list was prepared and uh, sent to the center for the selection procedure. The selection of cities was based on a host of criteria, including the manner of uh, citizen engagement, functioning of the municipal body, and its financial viability, visions and goals, and ensuring convergence with other schemes of urban governance. So, how does the smart city uh, defined in the official documents? I'm quoting from the uh, the Smart City Mission Statement and Guidelines um, of the uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. The answer is there is no universally accepted definition of a smart city. It means different things to different people. The conceptualization of smart city therefore varies from city to city and country to country. Depending on the level of uh, development, willingness to change and reform resources and aspirations of the city residents, a smart city would have a different connotation in India than say in Europe. Even in India, there is no one way of defining a smart city. So this is how the smart city is. Um, uh, mission statement and guidelines attempts to define the smart city and it says without attempting uh, to uh, explain how it is different from its connotation in developed uh, European nations. Largely the idea, uh, idea of a smart city taking its cue from Europe and other Western nations is a technocratic endeavor and making cities economically more competitive. With not much clarity on what does a smart city entail, it is largely understood to have seamless reliance on technology to provide services in a few selected cities. The stated goal of the Smart City Mission in India as per the mission guideline uh, is to drive economic growth and improve the quality of life of people by enabling local area development and harnessing technology, especially technology that, lead, uh, that leads to smart solutions, or smart outcomes. According to a study by an advocacy group, there are severe challenges in terms of violation of human rights in the pursuit towards developing smart cities, and there have been uh, several reported cases of forced evictions and displacement of people due to infrastructure development city beautification and smart city projects. The critique of smart cities have identified a lack of emphasis on ensuring citizenship rights in the development of smart cities, creating grounds for exploitation and denial of membership as a right to the city of such developed cities, to the vulnerable groups, including those living in informal settlements uh, for uh, want of adequate spaces uh, as a result of gentrification. The idea of a light of effect that some of the initial set of selected cities would lead to the selection of other potential smart cities and the aspect of citizen engagement during the preparation of the proposals have not found support from the civil society group owing to the narrow approach for the development and fun uh, fund allocation for mere 3% of the selected areas of, uh, for the development of smart cities. Mostly drawing from the earlier Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission, the Smart City Mission as an urban regeneration program lays focus on material production with emphasis on private players having wider say in governance. The mission ignores the right and justice aspect, undermines the rule of local municipal bodies, and an endeavor in capital accumulation in cities. A study of the smart city uh, mission in India, uh, it's a study by CPR, the title they must define uh, smart city in India, explores the question of what constitutes a smart city based on the analysis of 99 cities' proposals on the parameters of financial aspects, special purpose, vehicle like governance, smart cities project, and citizen participation. According to another study of some of the selected cities in India to be developed at smart cities, there's a serious lack of human rights-based approach which results in the denial of human rights to wider poor and vulnerable seg segments who do not only constitute the city but have been playing a crucial role in the development of critical infrastructure of such cities. The study, uh, Smart Cities in India, Smart for Whom, City for Whom by Housing and Alignment and Networks, uh, put under scrutiny the claim made of a more citizen-centric approach adopted in the framing of the proposals of the selected cities based on the parameters of citizen engagement the study doing a qualitative analysis from a human rights framework of the text of 99 Smart Cities proposal highlights proposals lacking a human rights pro approach and further creating grounds of discrimination, displacement and segregation of spaces in cities. The model of, uh, the model of governance based on special purpose vehicle has been criticized to have further undermined the role of constitutional framework of local municipal bodies by taking away their wider role in the decentralized governance mechanism established after the 74th constitutional amendment. The claim of reaching out to all sections of society in the framing of proposals in, a, in an effort of taking voices of all people on board, the study points to lack of a substantive approach, renting it an exercise in merely filling a gap in the bureaucratic exercise of 
ensuring citizen participation in urban governance. Uh, based on a survey of 23 cities uh, in India, uh, Janagraha in its 2017 report, uh, uh, titled Annual Survey of CDR City System 2017, uh, has been highlighted that there is a lack of transparency and citizen participation in cities in India. The engagement between government and citizens is weak owing to lack of structured platforms for citizen participation, no coherent participatory processes, weak citizen grievance redressal mechanism, and very low level of transparency in financing and operations. Uh, moving on to emerging scholarship, uh, academic scholarship inquiring into how the citizenship regime in India is undergoing a shift in cities that are, process in the, uh, the, that are in the process of becoming smart cities emerging. There are scholarships that have explored the idea of citizenship and how urban centric identity of citizenship is getting more traction in the process of urban development, creating zones of capital accumulation, segregation, and inequality. Besides, there are few scholarships from the global north. Uh, inquiring into the relationship between citizenship and smart cities. Now, uh, moving on to citizenship as a membership right. Citizenship entails membership of citizens in our community, their rights and duties, and enabling conditions for them to exercise their rights and perform their responsibilities. It aims at integration and gives a sense of belongingness to a, a nation state. We have a number of scholars written uh, on the idea of citizenship and have expanded the notion. Uh, it can be traced in the works of Hannah Ardent, T.H. Marshall, Michael Wolzio, Another philosopher who have looked at citizenship as a membership right in a political community. According to Ardent, uh, citizenship refers to the right to have rights, pointing to the belongingness to a political community or membership to claim other rights. Another theory of citizenship has been provided by Wolzo, who has lo also looked at it as bounded membership of a nation's society, nation and society. Marcel has looked at citizenship from a social rights perspective to reduce the impact of inequality. The development of citizenship rights, especially social rights of citizenship, according to Marshall, is aimed at reducing social inequality. Now, what are the emerging challenges and impact on citizenship rights? The Smart Cities Mission has an experiment in urban governance on the lines of other European nations. Though stated India is different from European model, sounds promising but not immune from creating challenges to sort out. What are these challenges? I see these challenges in terms of how urban spaces are claimed and claimed by its inhabitants and impact on citizenship rights, that is the right to the city deepening an identity of urban citizenship. This results in the exclusion of those who are denied citizenship rights in such developed smart cities. One such case of denial of citizenship rights as a result of development of smart cities in India is the demolition of houses of about 300 families in Charan Khan. In, um, living, they were living in informal settlements in Charan Khan in Dhanshala. And uh, this is one of the selected 100 cities to be developed as smart cities. There are other reported cases of demolition of houses and violation of people's housing and other citizenship rights creating a gulf between those living in would be smart cities and those out of it. Take another case of uh, impact on citizenship rights with the development of, uh, with the development of uh, smart cities in India. Is, uh, it is reported that 54% households in Azmir, in Rajasthan, and Jhansi, in Uttar Pradesh, uh, the two future smart cities, uh, get their septic tanks manually cleaned, a practice of manual, manual scavenging, which is legally banned, is still prevalent. So the challenges are immense on how to maintain a semblance between those living at uh, those at the receiving end of such development schemes, and get uh, and gets excluded from accessing the citizenship rights. Participation has been viewed as a mechanism of empowerment, entrenchment of citizenship rights, and social justice. However, there are challenges and limitations. Uh, the success and effectiveness of citizens' participation as a development approach has been widely debated. From top-down approach to bottom-up approach of participation, there exists. Uh, levels of power discourse. On the one hand, it has been used as an effective medium for attaining development with, uh, with a holistic approach, ensuring development of all. On the other, uh, under the guise of participation, development projects are implemented, resulting in the exclusion of the weaker and poorer sections who are often the target of these development projects. However, post implementalist uh, critics such notion and uh, point to the difference between uh, consensus and consent. The extent of qualitative participation uh, of the citizen in the area based development of smart cities and, and the means of participation contradicts the claim of effective citizen engagement as has been envisioned in the Smart Cities Mission document. It highlights, uh, it highlights that a substantial section of those who are homeless and live in slums where these smart cities are coming up are excluded besides the exclusion of other sections, for example, sexual minorities, single women, religious minorities, migrants, and will, and will have an impact on their right to development in cities where they have been living for long and will have a bearing on their citizenship rights and social justice in cities. With this, I'll stop here and invite your questions. And come. Thank you.
think my two panelists have uh, fairly uh, set up the stone of smart cities, uh, where Glenn has put a lot of uh, you know uh, frameworks uh, through which you can look into you know uh, assessing uh, you know this particular assemblage of smart cities, and uh, on my right, uh, yeah. uh, Deepak has uh, suggested about you know the the outcome, the citizenship, you know how that citizenship has been framed. So I situate uh, my work somewhere in between uh, where I'm trying to see smart city more as an imaginary and how this particular imaginary is getting constructed from which I try to you know elucidate what is it what is that particular governance mentality of managing the futures I have put uh, this particular uh, I mean uh, you know my question in situating between two hypotheses whether it's a, some kind of a Schumpeterian logic which is about creating some new networks, new production networks, jobs, etc. Wills, is it a logic of something of urban entrepreneurialism? So with this, I, uh, uh, you know, the background of my, uh, this particular paper, uh, so I would uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, as I told you, I have tried to put smart city as a, some kind of a new urban imaginary, uh, and within this imaginary, what is, the kind of power knowledge complex and what is that kind of social materi materiality that is getting you know reproduced uh, and wills uh, another question uh, i want to put is whether this particular smart city which is some kind of a futuring is is it some kind of an anticipatory action you know uh, with respect to the way uh, to solve the wicked problems of our cities or is it some kind of a disciplining for some kind of intended ends what are these intentions rationalities you know the the carving of the political and discursive space well, many of the people say that, okay, it's a, some kind of a pursuit of a real utopia. So is smart city some kind of a utopia which opens or deepens, uh, you know, citizen engagements and new forms of democracies? So I've tried to look at, you know, the smart city through this uh, anticipatory system, you know, try to understand what is this particular, you know, our social technical practice of managing the future. Uh, understanding the project of urban through which various futurings in the last, you know, uh, last, you know, since 1950s it has been this, you know, this uh, social materiality has been reproduced and reproduced, and how the smart city situates, uh, you know, in between. And so I'll quickly, uh, sorry, take you, you know, some kind of a rewind of this, you know, uh, we are very much glued to this some kind of a periodized futuring. So we are doing a periodized futuring every decade with some kind of a flagship program, whether it was IDCMT, which was looking at, you know, managing small towns, where urbanization was a big no, then looking at some kind of a mega city program, and then when everything failed, we tried to look at the urban renewal mission, and now we are looking, you know, as technology as some kind of an imperative to do some kind of a future to solve the bigger problems. But uh, and this again is a response because the previous programs were not able to manage the ineffective, you know, our urban agglomerations, which are not have been able to offer that kind of a productivity that has happened in other places. So all these uh, futurings have some kind of interjected in, you know, uh, you know, in between the sedimented social technical practice and the immediate em emergent regulatory regime, whether through smart cities, SPV, etc., etc., is coming. Uh, one thing which is, uh, uh, you know, for us very important to understand, which I also explore, how these futurings uh, some of structure the gaze of the actors, you know, the new empirics, the new intelligible categories that are being introduced uh, in, in, in the, you know, in our urban, you know, understanding of the cities, statecraft, politics, empirics. So this is one, one I want to explore. Uh, so I've synthesized my research question looking into whether this particular future in a smart city is some kind of a reworking of our current urban condition or is it an effort to creating some kind of a new urban reality or a new real utopia in terms of deepening dem democracy and citizen management and in between since we call it as a point of a departure where are the spaces of res resistance in these new futurings uh, so i framed my research question in a way that you know uh, how this new urban imaginary specifically these generic forms you can replace smart city with some other you know unsmart cities inclusive city ways we don't know in the next decade what kind of a imperative would be there intervenes in the normative idiom of managing urban. Uh, the theoretical framework, since I'm looking at more in terms of the mentalities which are not very, you know, uh, explicit, but they happen in a more ubiquitous and, you know, in a very tactical and a diffused manner. So I use this particular framework of governmentality where, the, you know, the conduct of actors, the conduct of the conduct which Foucault calls is, is being conducted through, you know, this various codified documents, uh, which operates 
through intelligible fields of intervention, problematization. Uh, the moment we have the integrated development small or medium towns, one program, it problematized urbanization through a different lens. Now the smart city is now problematizing the wicked problems through a different lens. And these are really visible in uh, genealogical uh, constructions and again in macro scale and you know individual disciplining. Uh, it's, uh, I will go a little quick. So research methods for literature review, some I uh, use a thick description where you know of two documents I have done. Uh, what one is the smart mission, uh, city mission and uh, statement and guidelines, which is the only document which uh, is a codified document for you know what should be a smart city. And second is a smart city challenge to stage two document, which is again a, a very one fit in temp template, which all the hundred cities have to fill in. So where everything is already you know disciplined. And then I also try to look into some kind of discourse analysis, trying to see you know, from the period from 2012 to 14, before this, uh, the government came in, how, you know, the smart city was really conceptualized in, in the narratives. Some interviews were also being conducted during one, one of the empirical studies. Uh, the terrain of urban, uh, because uh, when, when I'm talking about an ur urban imaginary, I, I need to have some kind of ontological and epistemological, uh, you know, understanding of the terrain of urban, and this is one of one paper which clearly, you know, uh, defines it including the notion of a smart city, it's a particular way of being governmental, where we define some kind of a new beneficiary relationships or creating new intelligible categories of like smart citizenry, smart citizens, in, you know, so again, uh, some kind of a particular way of being engaging uh, with the government, uh, you know, with the constituents, a particular way of being political, you know, the agency which is being constituted through smart city. And of course, the ontological suspensions which are being done in creating these, uh, you know, these imaginaries, uh, you know, if you look at some works of Spark, which talks about, you know, uh, when we're talking about these electronic cities, cosmopolitan, so there's always some kind of ontological s suspension, which is, in, in this case, is unsmart, or the people who are not being able to adapt this particular technological wares, smart wares. Uh, of course, there's some kind of state space rescaling has all, so this is what I define as a particular terrain of urban uh, for Indian cities. Uh, so my first set of conclusion from the literature review which has come you know through these uh, looking is is that the smart city situates right now in an in an assemblage where the governmentalities have been mediated to lay some kind of a dominant claim over the, over the spatial production which is always a sympathetic the state's desire you know uh, to, to structure these uh, and this has an implication because there cannot be any future trajectory where you know the state's claim over this production you know engenders more vice versa. Uh, this is what I call as Schumpeterian assumption, some kind of a simplistic causalities, uh, which I think most of my previous speakers have talked about, with smart urban futures like a political ideological neutrality, you know, uh, address redundancies in public services, uh, you know, creating new jobs, new combinations. And yesterday we had a very good lecture on Balaji Parthasarthi, which talked about that if the smart wares are are not contextualized to our needs. We are not being able to, we won't be able to create these new combinations of production means through the scaling, you know, with the kind of investments that are happening in the smart wares. Uh, the smart city situates in an assembly right now with where there is some kind of a corporate storytelling, you know, which very much echoes very much with the, you know, in the public policy circles because we have a, we had us, you know, this IT, you know, boom in the 90s, which were able to create a lot of jobs. So we we have a, some kind of a affirmative toward affirmativity to the towards the smart city program in public policy circles. That uh, the way the IT dot com was able to create a new middle class, maybe you know, uh, this smart city could you know rewind, uh, you know, or could solve the wicked problems. And this has been favorably canvassed. Uh, recently, Nandan and Kelly was appointed as uh, director for RBI Digital Payments. Uh, head. So these are favorably canvassed through IT firms, uh, you know, which are parts of our task forces, guilds, investment boards to invest on smart payers. And if you look at when during the 2012-14 period, you know, there were simplistic casualties, you know, of disorders through linear projections were created about migration, congestion, carbon footprint, uh, which, uh, I mean, uh, to create some kind of uh, ideological viewpoint that uh, there is a lack of urban innovation in concepts other than smart. So smart is the only way to, you know, uh, solve these simplistic causalities. Uh, I, then, you know, some kind of discourse analysis which 
which very much affirms that you know what we feel with the most in the public policy circles is that technological led urban entrepreneurialism uh, would create new avenues of capital production you know and hence there is an assumption that there would be a prosperity so there is a very stabilization of case which i call as the, the way the actors problematize that urban is a new economy and how do we you know introduce these new ways uh, so i have explained you about the terrain urban terrain the assembly which is very much corporate led the utterances which are very much about uh, you know uh, which are talking about that urban is a new economy and this particular document the codification of this particular document uh, if you do a thick description of this particular document you can find a lot of instances through which uh, some kind of a disciplining has already taken place so i will just go through one or two uh, instances uh, first the smart city architecture is a some kind of a best case business scenario where you know you create some kind of uh, you know uh, scoring parameters which basically you know uh, it rewards which are which is already functioning the best and david harvey explains this kind of you know uh, very well this kind of a scoring into the uh, you know this uh, in our urban programs because the investors if, which are the governments and the people who would be investing in smart wares this they seek surety of the investment in performers rather than non performers so you you engage those cities which you know have a best roi return on investment their their you know the uh, what is that called as uh, i mean their uh, fa uh, their budgets you know are uh, the non revenue portion is very less in their budgets so so it's some kind of a new liberal governmentality which is you know is going to extend you know it is going to increase the spatial inequalities even more if we follow this kind of a very performative oriented uh, you know uh, scoring through which we select and there is no end it started with 20 it's 100 i don't know it's going to 200 or 300 so because these parameters are, are not defined uh, so i raised this some kind of a provocative questions about whether the smart city program is some kind of a visioning or is it some kind of a disciplining so this is the one docu uh, you know uh, one statement the smart solution would ensure a decent quality of life and clean and sustainable environment so so it so it put it among the actors it introduces some kind of a mentality that okay the current ecological predic predicaments which are right now which are asymmetric can be endured it can be endured by using some kind of smart wares so we privilege some kind of a technological paraphernalia you know some kind of a technological uh, mentality uh, you know where alternate or the others you know of creating some kind of which harini also talks about about creating a more egalitarian social ecological mode of governing the commons is is somehow eliminated uh these are some kind of just again parameters for evaluation again they are very much rewarding the cities which which are you know uh, have a very you know a feasible feasible cities credibility you know find their op their operational efficiencies is good good and visioning you know just i, I would conclude uh again the visioning is again disciplined that the visioning should articulate use of information and communication to improve service delivery delivery again the proposal talks about how many you know smart technologies have been prescribed so uh again you know there is a some kind of a post political order which uh, you know because the way you are trying to network the corporations municipal actors vendors to creation of some kind of an spv we already you, there is a some kind of a you know an effort in you know governing our cities through some kind of a post political order so i so this is a one case of mangalore city uh, where i talk about this, this is a one template which all the 100 cities have to fill so there is no two or three templates only the content change and it has been disciplined in a way that you get a certain outcomes uh, the first is the smart but a feasible city so 40 points out of 100 points are given to incorporate the feasible technological solutions and eliminate so we need a smart city where the solution can only be feasible solutions so again you know aim at technological consumption with some feasible returns then again again i have given you the profiling the administrative efficiency it is all looked we are not looking at the other you know for example the administrative efficiency is again looked looked at in terms of biometric attendance but we are not looking at the offline modes you know where where the people who don't have the access you know is there a way to you know enumerate those uh, those people uh, i there is some i will talk about this particular you know uh, the area based program how the area based programs are getting structured in case of mangaluru you know because there is a, some so much strong disciplining which is done for financial feasibility so so there is some kind of which harvey calls as some kind of a disneyfication you know of certain enclaves is happening where you know 
uh, some kind of materialization of complex land and real estate speculation is happening and tensions towards some kind of a monopolized renting of these newly carved enclaves is, is in the process. Uh, so, so to attain the fin financial feasibility, uh, this particular instance of you know area-based program. So, what is being proposed in these very cultured enclaves in Mangaluru? You know, I'm just showing you this Bandar area. If you have been to Mangaluru, what has been proposed is a riverfront development, walking promenade, yacht club, waterfront park. So, so attain those kind of financial feasibilities. We are you know trying to create this new Disneyfication of our you know certain enclaves, which you know uh, uh, certain delineations. Uh, so, I conclude. Uh, with that smart urbanism, you know, in a in a calculus of infrastructure materiality, you know, it circum navigates the possibility of new utopias, you know. So that's the first. Second, this particular smart city program is some kind of a quilting, you know, it forecloses to foreclose the politics, to, to foreclose, uh, you know, how the cities need to be discussed. It forecloses the the other uh, through a codified codified document. Uh, it disciplines actors and citizens to, you know, adopt particular gazes, gazes that one are feasible and, you know, fits into global circuits of capital flow. Uh, lastly, uh, and this has a similarity of smart cities both in the global south and global north because it's a Schumpeterian logic in the hindsight to attract investments, innovation, uh, innovative enterprises and jobs, but in the foresight it's a urban entrepreneurialism in, in fact. And, you know, and what, you know, it's a, I just, it's a protraction of some kind of a normative norms, it's no ut utopia, it's again a particular way of being political, governmental and you know, through which is again done through suspension of certain ontological, uh, you know, status of its constituents. Yeah, thank you. So we are done with the three presentations and uh, <coughs> so how do we do this? I have three questions. Should I ask those questions first and then open it up? Uh, my questions are uh, in the realm of playing the devil's advocate. So uh, I'll uh, turn it around and basically argue against what you guys have been presenting. And maybe that might be a good idea of opening it up. <coughs> and anybody can take it up. Uh, so there's uh, like no priority. So uh, my first question is centered uh, uh, around this capital e extraction thing. So. Uh, so if we are not able to kind of create new opportunities of capital extraction, how are we going to fund development in the broader region? Uh, so in India, uh, we have been grappling with this problem for almost 60, 70 years. Uh, and, uh, and money is coming from these cities and we need to capitalize on these cities as much as we can to subsidize uh, a lot of uh, programs that uh, exist in the in rural areas as well as in the mm, peri-urban areas or technically not being called as urban. So that's my first uh, devil's advocate question. So uh, of course, uh, you may not be doing it right. Uh, so there may be some like question, uh, some answers in, in in, in these realms, but let's talk about these things. Uh, my second uh, point is that uh, sometimes in like governmentality, as he, as Purushottam pointed out, we have to be also aware of, be aware of uh, possibilities where we can do something. So bureaucracy is bound by rules. And uh, if we can create certain opportunities where something innovative happens, something new happens, uh, we don't know. Even for normative program programs, we are not sure about how it will play out on the equity front. But say, I'll illustrate this. Uh, one of the vehicles to do this is setting up of an SPV, a special purpose vehicle. And that SPV is vested with some powers. Uh, so there is a possibility of doing something using this window as an opportunity because it was like trapped in bureaucracy or in rules and procedures. So, uh, so maybe it may not be done right, but possibly 
some people are using this as an opportunity to at least do some things. We, we may debate on what they are doing and how they are doing, but that is the second point. And the third point and, uh, is about and largely uh, ad, uh, addressed to Deepak. Now the citizenship question is already there. Smart city and citizenship correlation, uh, is, it, is it because of this that uh, people are not getting their rights or are you trying to say that uh, earlier there was no such problem or this problem is, this is making it uh, more acute? Maybe there is a possibility but uh, uh, this correlation uh, uh, might be uh, might require some more consideration and more evidence uh, to begin with. I am not very um, uh, convinced. And the fourth uh, question is, and this is addressed to all that. Okay, suppose we imagine an articulation of having a smart city. Uh, I know that everyone has pointed out to one, one uh, many aspects. So, uh, and of course, these programs are set up to deliver something. So, uh, what then they should deliver? And, uh, and what should be uh, the various elements and the prioritization that we define in order to deliver something which, which in your definition is uh, the best possible outcome? So, these are my four... Uh, questions. Anybody can take it up and then we'll open it up. So this is like nothing like being very critical but just uh, reflection. I wanted to answer the last question that you raised, sort of go in reverse order. And um, so within our scope or our research, we look at wicked problems and we look at these 21st century crises, which are in themselves wicked problems. There's also theories that say that wicked problems intertwine to become super wicked problems, but I don't want to get into that. So the way that we define the solution to a wicked problem or that why a problem is wicked in the first place is a distinct lack of time, resources, manpower to test multiple solutions. So the only way to know if a wicked problem has been solved is for it to already have worked. There's no test procedure. Similarly, when we think about 21st century crises, these are big issues, climate change, poverty, hunger. We don't have time as a society to spend crafting multiple solutions to address these, especially given their intertwining nature. So a smart city, what it brings in that essence is a solution to these 21st century issues these big overlying questions. The problem is our tools for evaluating its ultimate success lie only after the storm has been weathered or not weathered. And therein lies the sort of conundrum of how do we come up with the perfect solution? I think we can loop that uh, analysis uh, to the first question uh, concerning uh, the problem of development uh, and the question of capital and what do we do with capital and the challenge of development. In that, the question is um, the urgency of the crises that we face. And if we persist with pursuing capitalist development, in order to address the issues and the problems that we have, then right, um, the crises right, will be upon us um, and, and, and exacerbated. Right? It, it's, um, in some ways, it's falling into the trap of development that in of itself right, is what's causing the problem. Right? And so, do we keep pursuing that path all the while the wicked problem right, gets more and more wicked right, and uh, becomes right, that super wicked problem? I would argue perhaps that the question of capitalist development and regional development addressing the issues of poverty um, is quickly becoming a moot point in the sense that 
right, that collapses upon us. Right, so if we're, you know, if we're looking at those questions, we're looking at the wrong question. We're looking at the wrong issue. Uh, we're building the wrong cities. We're doing smart cities. Um, you know, perhaps they should have been done 50 years ago. You know, type proposition. Yeah, uh, I would suggest that uh, I mean, the capitalism is here to stay. You know, uh, this particular form of uh, you know the circulation. Uh, but what can be done is is some kind of uh, ineffective production. You know. The, the redundancies in, in that particular capital production, if those can be tackled, uh, I think that could be one of the imperatives. Uh, second is, the, there's a lot been done, in, for example, in social innovation you know, methods and also in co-production cooperatives where, you know, uh, some alternates to capitalism along with, you know, with the capitalism has been experimented and has been quite successful. So if we, you know, uh, there's a good book about uh, Eric Olin Wright, which he talks about all these experiments like Wikipedia, social innovation, you know, which which have stayed with the with the dominant forms of capital production. Uh, maybe you know, if we try to relook into those, you know, methods and include that, we could you know reduce these redundancies. Uh, thank you sir, for your question, but I agree with you. Too, but, um, don't fully answer your question, but maybe I'll try to. Like uh, come with some sort of uh, response to your uh, question. Yeah, uh, this uh, idea of uh, citizenship, uh, uh, idea of citizenship, and especially in terms of smart cities, is uh, already there right from the like it was there in the 12th plan, uh, the vision and mission aspect of that, and also uh, in the JNURM as well. But um, what I'm trying to um, do in my research work is to look at the extent of shift uh, in the narrative that is happening. And um, one thing that I can uh, one, uh, I can think of right now, uh, for example, um, SPV rate governance, uh, it, it leads to the dis dis uh, enfranchisement of our local bodies. I'm not saying that uh, this dis disenfranchisement hasn't happened earlier. It has happened earlier as well. But what is the extent of this uh, uh, departure that has happened is subject of inquiry. And also, uh, when I... Uh, when I uh, talk about in terms of uh, the changing narrative of citizenship, I also think of uh, how this idea of urban, um, you know, uh, urban citizens is getting entrenched. So I did my uh, FL dissertation wherein I uh, I looked at uh, the legal discourse analysis on slum demolition and forced eviction in urban India uh, with a case study uh, in Delhi. But I also looked at case laws uh, uh, from different metros. For example, uh, I looked at a case law of uh, Bomb Bombay High Court wherein. Uh, Bombay High Court order to it was a 2009 order, and the order uh, uh, was given to remove people living uh, uh, along Tansa water pipeline. It's uh, I don't know exactly the length of the pipeline, but the order was to remove people living along uh, this water pipeline because the court order said I exactly I'm not uh, quoting uh, the exact order, but the language was like that. That pipeline service citizens of Mumbai, quote unquote, citizens of Mumbai. That means, what do you identify the, uh, in, uh, by calling citizens of Mumbai? And that means certain sort of urban-centric identity is getting entrenched. And uh, that's how uh, the impact of citizens could, can be gauged. So that's a uh, small response. Thank you. Thank you. So I open it up. Can you? Uh, my question is across the panel to have just a clarity in understanding whether we have, if, whether, if there exists a contradiction in understanding the meaning of smart and uh, the way to what urban theory suggests and the way we have translated it in reality, in ground realities in India. Like what actions we are do, the actions that we are doing, and what urban theory suggests. So, is there exist a contradiction over there, and uh, understanding of what smart theory is? Let's take another. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for these insightful presentations. Uh, so my question is again to the panel. Uh, so uh, f to my understanding, uh, the Government of India website uh, states that uh, the special purpose vehicle is going to be a planning authority of that particular area for uh, this, uh, those uh, individual smart cities. Uh, again, uh, I believe that all the areas, all the urban uh, cities already have a planning authorities. 
a couple of them have multiple planning authorities already like for example in mumbai we have the municipal corporation of greater mumbai plus we have uh, slum rehabilitation authority both of them are planning authority then we have more uh, you know spvs adding to it so uh, there is going to be an inevitable uh, conflict of interest if i like if i'm right so uh, i i believe like uh, on the ground level we are trying to uh, create a simplification uh, in the processes and you know um, like creating single window uh, dealing and stuff but at the ma macro level uh, we are creating more conflicts so is there going to be a specific demarcation of jurisdiction or the boundaries or the uh, division of finances on all these fronts i mean how how the conflict of interest is going to be tackled on uh, from the spv's front this is my question yeah thanks break damn thing. Uh, I think I'll answer your question first in that it's we can just look at the word smart right intelligent smart synonyms Wh how is it that we've sort of arrived at this weird warped definition wherein when that word is suddenly in front of the other word cities we start thinking about computers and sensors everywhere I think that's very strange and that's sort of been normalized after you know it's it started as a fad and you know then was normalized normalized through the internet of things but i think that what we've seen by the use of the word smart almost a is is it's a marketing term one is to it's to gain investment like i said for a product that doesn't exist and doesn't have a prototype and you need a catchy name for something like that the second thing is um I'm sorry, I completely lost my train of thought for a second. Um, the second thing is that uh, we need a, a sort of a way to identify uh, a, a goal. And what we've seen is uh, almost a corruption of the the initial trajectory of what the smart cities mission hoped to achieve. See, instead of starting with you know an ideal city and then reverse uh, working backwards and seeing how if you if you imagine a future and then you reverse engineer to what the present state is, the, the shortcomings of the present state of affairs become very obvious because you have to compare them to what you want to exist. Unfortunately, government of India really doesn't like doing this because then it unveils their faults historically. So the use of the word smart has sort of pushed away that. It's sort of diverted the initial aim and the goal of that. And and so what we've seen as what was touted as the, the savior of, of India, you know, has turned into some sort of a marketing term for a very underwhelming five-year plan. Uh, I, I would just give a general comment. Uh, see, uh, the, if you look at the genealogical, ev you know, the evolution of the smart city as a, as a concept, it comes from a network growth and smart urbanism. So, uh, so, but the mobility of this particular concept in the smart city document, if you really look at it, it makes very explicit that there is, it starts with a statement that there is no general definition, but if you read the document full, it, it, sa it says that in the imagination of Indian citizen, the smart city means infrastructure. So, so there is an assumption through which this disciplining has already, you know, been introduced. And uh, I think there, there would be another research question, how this mobilities, you know, the definition of mobilities uh, take place uh, and how they're muted. Uh, I think that, uh, but but there are a few instances where the provincialization of this particular term has happened. For example, in, in if you look at some kind of, we did some kind of a discourse analysis initially, we found that this particular smart city as a concept during the political discourse is what was in the villages and the rural areas was, ta was talked as some kind of urbanization, of, you know, creating big villages. So, of course, the provincialization of this term has has taken place. Uh, but again, you know, the mutations and evolving into a certain, you know, typology is, is of course, a, uh, you know, an inquiry, empirical inquiry that can be done. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the question of uh, special purpose vehicle, uh, yes. Uh, it's, uh, certainly, it's pretty bizarre kind of idea that is being propagated. Certainly, uh, 
this special purpose vehicle uh, essentially is, will be responsible for the dispersal of funds uh, for the implementation of projects and uh, that is uh, and there is a seriously uh, there is a conflict of interest between the uh, special purpose vehicle and other municipal bodies that are in existence and uh, how, in which way this conflict of interest is being played out it's still something to um, uh, inter interrogate uh, but um, one thing that can be uh, ascertained, I mean, uh, that can be said that uh, uh, delaying the uh, uh, setting up of some of this special purpose making in these smart cities uh, reflects that uh, there are some conflict of interest that, that is under uh, play. So that's something we need to figure it out. Uh, yeah, I have a question for the panel. Uh, so, so we have this broad uh, policy level analysis that's happening um, like for the 100 smart cities or the smart city mission as a whole and there has hardly any um, case study research being done maybe about Dolera or Bhuvaneshwar, right? Or Ahmedabad right now. So why do you think that's happening? Why is there not much case study research happening on smart cities at a micro level or project level? See, m maybe my question is naive. I'm just wondering, what is the uh, expected or proposed population of each of these so-called smart cities? And then the designated so-called smart cities, are the people in those who already living there, have they been asked what do they, what are their expectations, whether they are uh, prepared for changes which will bring when the so-called smart city comes into being? And the final question I have is, whether there will be a new set of uh, rules or uh, laws which will govern these smart cities because the existing system cannot work in those places. Because as uh, somebody has mentioned already here, the different laws which we have to go through in the city, they cannot be applicable. If they are applicable, then we forget about the smartness, we will just be unsmart cities. Yeah, I would like to just clarify the question that you raised. Bombay is a wrong example because there is no smart city there and there are so many bodies there. So don't compare Delhi and Mumbai and other metros. My um, experience with uh, SPV and smart city in Indore has been quite positive in the sense that it, there is hardly any conflict of interest. Why I'm saying this is the CEO of the smart city limited, the SPV, is also the additional commissioner of municipal corporation. The executive director of Smart City Mission is the Indore Municipal Commissioner. The chairman of the board of directors is the collector of the district. So this is uh, something which has been created, I think for, at a short, for a short period of time, it's going to dissolve maybe after 2022. So for continuation and sustainability, the municipal corporation virtually will take over maintenance of what has been done. So I don't find any conflict of interest. The advantage of SPV is money comes directly from government of India into the accounts of the smart city, not going through the state treasury. And the flexibility is given to address within the overall framework what is required for the city. So I am finding this very comfortable situation with SPV. Uh, taking an example of Indore. The second question about sharing experiences, every year there is a conference of CEOs of smart city. Last one was in Bhopal and almost all 100 smart cities were there to share their experiences, learn from each other, case studies are presented there so that we can replicate what good models are there. So those are the two things I thought I would just inform. Analysts respond. So, uh, I have my colleague Sudeshna here who has grappled with this question for many years, and we have Vinita also from SPA who has consulted many cities. So, it will be nice to hear your quick views. Let them, let us listen to your views. I am not much of an expert on this, but both of you are. Okay. See, uh, uh, 
So the way the smart city has been structured, it, it's a very mediated devolution. When you talk about the set, I think somebody asked about uh, what is the population sign and how, how they've been. It's a very mediated devolution, you know, where, uh, I mean, it, so there is there's a system of points, you know, where the state select the kind of cities and then uh, again there's a, some kind of a competition where again the st uh, certain cities are selected. So in a way the outcomes are quite mediated through the, you know, the systems of parameters that has been, uh, uh, you know, codified in these documents. So, so I mean, uh, those similarities you will find in those 100 smart cities that are, that are being selected. Uh, second question is, uh, I think is, see it's a very complex, uh, you know, inquiry to really understand that how um, this particular form of smart city has you know emerged uh, i think we we need a lot of layer layer citizenship layer you know the, the i think the first uh, panel talked about various layers through through which these inquiries can be you know understood uh, lastly i want to you know uh, just uh, say is that uh, see spv is a manifestation of you know our mentality of you know a public sector undertaking you know where you know it's 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 again you know a state's control you know over the spatial production you know so i think in the first document of the smart city document which we did a thick description the the i think the mayor word was not even mentioned in the i think it was once mentioned in the in that particular document and there are a lot of news reports in Mangaluru where, you know, we I did my uh, empirical studies where the corporators are not aware of what is being happening in the smart city. The enunciation of what is happening in the smart city is a very at a very elitist, you know, maybe certain CEOs or you know the corporators. I think that even the meanings. I think some people are doing a research on what does the smart city mean for the individuals. There could be you know many definitions. So I think the SPV is our manifestation of this state control over you know in, in controlling the spatial production and. It, it has not delivered in the past and I don't know what optimism we have in this particular SPV to deliver, you know, solution to the wicked problems. I make this a little with a ranting. Uh, I'm sorry for that. So, I think in the interest of time, let us have these two. Reshna. Actually, I mean, uh, my question is uh, probably directed at the entire panel. It's not at anyone specifically. But uh, I think across all of the papers, there has been quite a lot of engagement with um, sort of the conceptual implications of what this kind of a mission um, means, both, I mean, in terms of citizenship, in terms of um, uh, addressing some of our wicked problems that we are facing right now. Um, but I would like to hear a little bit from all of you in terms of is there uh, like what is sort of fundamentally sort of changing in terms of state practices when we are talking about smart cities because again a lot of um, I mean we got heard an example from Indore Aurangabad is another case that I am somewhat familiar with is that a lot of this uh, people who are already involved in urban governance at the local levels are also part of this new uh, set of practices that are emerging. And so if, we, if, we, if, uh, if I could hear a little bit about material, like if you can uh, reflect a little on the material changes in actual state practices and the kind of urban outcomes that are coming out of the Smart Cities project, not the way that they are marketed, but more in terms of, for example, Aurangabad is doing public transportation system. Like their area development plan is uh, to invest in a fleet of buses uh, for the city. So that kind of a reflection that how has this changed what is going on in our cities already? And in terms of the linkage between the national government and the local government, that this particular lens helps us understand because that's something um, you know, somewhat different. I mean, it's not completely new. JNU RM did that as well, but just in terms of how that is getting reframed a little bit. Glenn is actually going to answer this question, but I'm going to preface his answer to this question. Um, I'm glad that you weren't so specific as to say what material and physical changes have actually been instituted on the ground, because that is the that is where we should really say 
there's a massive lack of exactly that, correct? So I had some figures in my PowerPoint, which we don't need to pull up again, but it was something like 3% of scheduled, not like total, scheduled project had actually been successfully implemented. And that doesn't even mean that they've been implemented successfully. That just means that they have been implemented. So it's very hard to evaluate something that is either behind schedule or caught up in the bureaucratic mess that is Indian government at a state and a central level. But um, when you evaluate those, you're left with just a, a dreg of what is actually, ha what is scheduled to have been in existence. Okay, Glenn, now you make more sense. So um, I think it's a brilliant question. And part of it might have to do with the, the question about uh, case studies. And, and the lack of case studies in the sense that uh, what the, um, the work that we have on Dolora, that was a project that started before the 100 Smart Cities missions. So our real case study is you know, not even in the context of that big national project. And then um, one of the on-the-ground projects that we're familiar with is in Jaipur. And we spent some time there talking with city officials. Um, and on the ground projects there is uh, almost exclusively targeted at tourism um, and how to enhance right the tourism economy. And it com you know completely uh, makes invisible, right? You know, using the optics here, um, you know the reality of the city and the inhabitants of the city. Um, okay, it'll help the potentially help the economic growth by fostering the, the tourism, um, and it'll add an element of public safety and security uh, for the tourists with the rather selected right surveillance, right. Um, but it's it's really not touching right the broader population in any meaningful way, and then the infrastructure and what's actually on the ground and built and put in um, is extraordinarily limited in its usefulness. Um, it, it 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 just doesn't seem to me to be something real. It seems to be, um, well, we had a conversation with a gentleman who uh, has a tender for here in Bangor, and he basically explained to us the complexities of um, building the infrastructure basically for routers and um, that they can't go underground because of the traffic. You can't start digging and you know the, the mess that that would make of the urban you know, traffic flow. And he basically explained, so we started hanging the routers to fulfill our contract in the trees. And then we started walking around and you start noticing that there's routers hanging from the tree. So is this your smart city? Right, and so this is your this is your on the ground, you know, smart urbanism, um, and you know, at what point are we really talking about Roy's notion of you know the informality, the idiom of you know urban planning and design that's just going to overtake and overwhelm, right? The um, you know kind of high modernist notion, right, of smart urbanism. And you know, does that then reproduce over time, right? The challenge, right, of urban planning, right, in India. Um, so I, I, you know, I can't speak to the specifics about what it means for urban governance, right? But the outcomes, right? Either they're non-existent, or they're holes in the ground, or you know, they're some form of smart technology that comes up very short from uh, what perhaps um, is uh, being projected. It, it's not what's in the brochure. Certain kind of, you know, uh, and to partially to answer sir's question of whether people were being asked to uh, uh, what kind of uh, smart city or the kind of services they need in such developed zones. Uh, 
So that kind of uh, responsabilization is creeping in. Because they're smart cities, these uh, uh, cities proposals were selected on the basis of uh, citizen, one of the big parameters was citizen engagement. And that's quite debatable because the kind of qualitative analysis that most of the uh, so far studies that have, have been uh, done by CPR and Housing and Land Rights Network, they have, uh, you know, uh, uh, based on the uh, uh, qualitative analysis of uh, 99 smart cities proposal. Uh, they have said that uh, these uh, uh, these citizen uh, participation are uh, tokenistic at best and you know basically uh, a bureaucratic exercise to fill in uh, you know a citizen engagement requirement and this reminds me of uh, you know whether I don't know exactly where, who said this uh, David Harvey or Lafayette that if you have created this world you are condemned to live in this world so um, you know and through this uh, mode of citizen engagement what is being happening that citizens are I mean are being made responsible for the kind of services they require uh, to live in this, uh, such kind of developed zones. So that's what I can think of. Okay. I think uh, we are over time now, so uh, we'll, we'll close this panel. So thank you all presenters and also the audience uh, for the wonderful discussion. And I think you can take this discussion forward. I think there's a tea break now, I guess. Yeah. So thank you so much. <laughs>